So welcome back to the second session of today's um, workshop. We um, now welcome Vitaly. Vitaly will introduce us to his tool set to location um, for spot transcriptomic data. Um, and we are welcoming him to the theoretical introduction into the tool and then also to the tutorial um, on this amazing tool. So I will stop sharing the schedule and we can, um, Vitaly can share his screen. Again, we will have questions over Slido, Zulip and GitHub, and we will raise them after the theoretical introduction and then again after the tutorial. So now the stage is yours, Vitaly, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Anna and Giovanni, for organizing this and for uh, host, for offering the chance to present and explain our method. Um, So as Anna mentioned, uh, I will start from a theoretical introduction into the method and um, then go on uh, to um, the tutorial. So what I'm going to talk about to, uh, to you today is how you can um, use social location to do comprehensive special mapping of complex tissues. And hopefully the examples I present um, give a um, good use case of how it's done. But before I start, I actually want to give a brief personal introduction. So I'm Vitaly, uh, Vitaly Klishevnikov. I am a PhD student at the Welcome Sanger Institute working with Bayraktar Group, Stegler Group and Teichmann Group. Um, before the PhD, I also had quite a lot of research experience and uh, interest in um, protein architecture, modeling, aging, and uh, all, of, all, all together this, uh, this shaped my interest towards understanding how cells work, age, and break. And to approach this problem, I'm using, um, I'm trying to investigate gene regulation and cell interactions using systems biology and Bayesian modeling. And um, as you might notice during this uh, talk, I'm also a big fan of tea, meditation, and um, a few other things. So that's a brief personal introduction from me, just to give you an idea of um, where I'm coming from. And uh, from here, I will jump to um, the acknowledgements. One of the very exciting parts about this project for me was uh, just how collaborative it was and how much input I was getting on different parts of um, the workflow from um, uh, all of the all of our uh, fantastic collaborators. In particular, I want to um, highlight um, Artem Schmatko and Emma Dan and Alexei Vazidis for their invaluable contributions to the model development, as well as Artem Lomachin. And also, of course, um, Omer and um, Oliver Stegley, who contributed a lot to this work. And essentially a range of our collaborators who, work, who I'm working with on um, this project as well as my ongoing work. So given my bigger interest in understanding how cells work and age, um, I would like to give the following introduction into how uh, you can think about special mapping. So there is a certain identity of the cell and with advance of single cell profiling methods, we can use that, um, we can use the transcriptome of cells and now not just the transcriptomes, but also epigenetic profiles. We can use that information to um, get an idea of cell identity from the expression phenotype. And this cell identity in turn arises from certain set of gene regulation programs. And the way special mapping fits into this picture is that um, in vivo context is, uh, in the context, the special context in which cells reside is important both for interpreting um, what is the function of very specific 
clusters in uh, in the data, but it's also about knowing um, when certain gene regulatory events are affected by uh, neighboring cells in the environment. So there is all there is always this um, bidirectional relationship, and it's good to think about both. And in today's talk, I will give you mainly um, in both talk and um, the tutorial work walkthrough. I will give you an examples or I will give you examples of using spectral mapping to understand more about the cell phenotype. But also there is some exciting developments in using the output of cell location to look at um, how cells affect each other. Um, which I will mention um, later in the talk, which involves NSAM, which you learned about yesterday. So to enable this picture of um, using special mapping to better understand cell identity, to understand the tissue context of cell identity, um, we developed a cell location. So the location is a Bayesian model that integrates single cell transcriptomic data, which can be either single cell or single nucleus, and uh, special transcriptomics data. Um, and the special transcriptomics data that I will mainly focus on here is um, Visium, but uh, I will also show that uh, cell location can be applied to other special transcriptomics technologies. So, so the location integrates these two data types to essentially provide you cell type locations in the tissue with the resolution limited by the special transcriptomics. And you can then use the cell type locations in the tissue for a range of downstream analysis tasks, which I think will grow in as, um, um, as we get more and more uh, tools, more and more, um, uh, as people think through more and more implications. At this point, I would uh, again like to acknowledge uh, the model development has been a very productive collaboration with Ole Stegli and his group at Amble. So just brief um, overview uh, of um, the resolutions of special technologies and how it uh, fits with some of the um, both benefits of using cell location as well as um, some of the questions you might have. So uh, we are mainly focusing on specially resolved sequencing technologies where you can um, put a barcoded uh, nucleotides that can capture RNA from the cells. You can, uh, you can put those um, oligonucleotides, barcoded, uh, sequence barcoded nucleotides at different locations using either array printing methods such as done by um, the next special transcriptomics and the next visium, or by placing um, bits with random barcodes and then determining their special locations in some way, which is the basis of SlideSeq. And I'm sure there will be more methods that um, um, go through um, this technology developments. So, um, one of the benefits of this approach is that it gives you unbiased transcriptome-wide analysis, so you don't need to pre-select genes and then realize that, well, we didn't select genes for the relevant cell population, so now we need to repeat the large experiment, the large imaging experiment again. Um, it also relies on standard histology and molecular biology protocols, at least as a visium, um, and um, the special resolution is rapidly improving with new papers coming out. It seems that every few months. Um, the special resolution was indeed rapidly improving over the past several years. And um, I think now the progress is more on the side of actually optimizing how well RNA detection works. The, the, uh, one big point to uh, point, one big thing to point out at this point is that um, one of the dominant technologies is Tenax Visium, which has the resolution of 50 micrometers. Um, I realize that this diagram is not quite correct. So it has 50 micrometers RNA capture spots 
Um, I would uh, call them locations in this talk, but the, uh, they are often named as uh, spots. And these spots can capture a name, have different sequence barcodes, and they are positioned in a hexagonal grid. And this is important uh, to know because um, it's important to know that these spots are large because they include the dislocations are large because they include multiple cells and this creates problems for uh, analyzing and interpreting this data. So when we were developing cells location, we set out on a few criteria that the method needs to fit in order to be useful for um, the kind of questions about um, cell signaling environments, about interpreting um, cell states through, this, through special mapping about answering those types of questions. So the first criteria was that it should, so the location should be able to map similar, uh, transcriptionally similar and rare cell, cell types. And I will show you some examples of um, how we achieve this. Um, in addition, cell to location should enable the downstream analysis tasks, such as identifying co-located cell types, tissue zones, and um, this is that exciting development of um, Visium application of NSAM, I think also more direct than cell communication analysis. In addition to dealing with those aspects of the special data, we also need to be able to use single cell rna references and single nucleus cell rna references that are composed of multiple batches and technologies, so really complicated cell atlases. So we need to provide tools for people to utilize those. And finally, one of the criteria that we had is that uh, we should implement a model in such a way that it's easier to extend this to other technologies and other related problems, such as, um, let's say, mapping cancer clones, as opposed to just cell types. So how does the location work? I will just give a brief overview and then jump over to show some example results um, and benchmarks that we did. Um, so self location, um, as I mentioned before in more high level, self location uses single cell rna reference of cell types, which is our, our average expression of every gene, ABCD, in every cell type, where cell types are not um, the more um, the cell types are not defined in biological terms, but these are just different cell clusters, different subpopulations. And on the other hand, cell location takes observed um, RNA counts um, at every location. And then and this information is used in the following Bayesian model. And as I mentioned just in the previous slide, we need to be able to combine multiple single cell RNA seq batches in, um, to derive these uh, signatures of cell populations. Um, the model used for that is similar in architecture to what I will explain now, but uh, I'm omitting it for the, in the interest of time. Um, so cell so location, um, models uh, observed RNA counts in uh, special locations as negative binomial. This is just count distribution that allows to um, ac flexibly account for unexplained variance in the data. And we model this variance as a BOSS experiment, BOSS kind of section, slide, and um, gene-specific. And then the mean of this distribution is um, Functorized into a range of components, where the most important ones are um, reference signatures of cell types and the cell type abundance. So the reference signatures of cell types are derived from the single cell RNA seq data, and the goal of the model is then to figure out uh, what, um, which cell types and in what abundance, which combinations of cell types in what abundance could have given us the RNA counts at every special location. So at every special location S for every gene G. And um, to do this, we need to account for a range of technical factors, uh, which are technical difference in sensitivity between a single cell and special technology, which is somewhat equivalent to regressing out this effect. Uh, we also need to account for additive background. So um, 
think uh, soup and free floating RNA, but in the special data. And we need to account for the per location normalization, which corrects for detection sensitivity differences within the slide, within the section. And so that, that, those are the technical factors. But in addition to improve the sensitivity, because we're using the Bayesian framework to um, define this model, we can flexibly define priors that add additional information, help the model learn. And one of such priors is learning similarity in cell type locations. So we we, you can say that we automatically try to learn not just uh, the amount of each cell type F at every location as, but also which cell types tend to collocate. And as I will show later, this improves sensitivity of our method. And we additionally, to help with estimation of um, absolute levels of cell abundance, we use cell number priors. So in comparison to so altogether in comparison to our to other methods, what salt location can do is it combines all of these uh, it combines a range of features that improve both sensitivity and robustness. Uh, it can model multiple experiments, so sections, multiple. Um, sets of locations that were sequenced together. Um, in addition, we offer a method for estimation of reference signatures that accounts for budget effects, not in the special, but in the single cell RNA-seq data. And we use a modular uh, Bayesian framework that enables the com higher complexity of the model and extension to further applications. So that's, uh, this is a more theoretical overview of how the model works. And now I just want to briefly jump over two examples of how we apply it in the paper, one of which we will go through in, um, um, in this tutorial and also show you some benchmark results that more directly um, that actually confirm um, the benefits that I'm talking about now. So in, in the paper, we test drive, um, this is um, not just salt location, but in general, the approach of integrating single cell and special transcriptomics data on the mouse brain. And specifically, we focus on um, astrocytes, which are cells that, are, that have been long thought of as passive support cells for the brain. However, as we are finding out with this study, as well as with um, a range of previous work, astrocytes are actually quite transcriptionally heterogeneous. And, um, also, the transcriptional differences between the subtypes you see in this UMAP are small. Um, all of these subtypes actually have quite distinct special locations. And along the lines of um, salt location enabling high sensitivity, I want to specifically highlight this population of habenular astrocytes. These are astrocytes that are mapped by salt location to a very particular region of the mouse brain here. Um, and um, this region is called the habenula, hence habenular astrocytes. Um, and in, so self location was able to map this very rare population, which is also transcriptionally fine and not that different from other astrocyte types to a very specific area in the brain. And we were able to validate that using a single molecule fish. And this is just a, a one example, not, not a comprehensive benchmark, but one example that illustrates the sensitivity of our method. So before I go on in the benchmarks, I just want to mention that um, salt location is not just for Visium and spot-based transcriptomics, but it's also for um, other related technologies, um, namely we show that it can be applied to SlideSeq, and we are currently working on uh, scalability improvements to enable application of our method to SlideSeq as well as to Visium HD that will eventually be released by 10x. So that's one example, um, mapping hippocampal cells in um, um, in the mouse brain as well as cortical neurons across the mouse brain. And another example that I want to mention is that because uh, salt location is defined, um, because it's easy to extend salt location, we can adapt it to other technologies that have other noise and technical um, 
issues. And one of such technologies is um, a nanostring GMX DSP data. Um, if you are working with this data type, just take a note that we also um, modified self location to work with it. And now to the benchmark. Um, we did quite um, a lot of comparisons to other methods and trying to try to understand um, the features of our method. But one of the things that I will highlight now, and, and feel free to uh, ask questions or um, check out the paper, I will just highlight one benchmark, which I think shows the most important point. Um, so we want to know whether our method or any method for that, for that matter for special mapping purposes uh, is able to map uh, transcription <clears throat> transcription defined grain cell populations. I'm sorry. Um, so to do this, uh, we can classify. We to do this, we used um, human uh, gut data set, which includes lymphoid populations, and we took uh, which includes. Uh, Cell populations located to the lymphoid follicles, we know that they should be in the lymphoid follicles, and we can take this set of populations and divide them into transcriptionally fine and transcriptionally distinct by comparing their transcription by comparing their reference cell type signatures. So we have a set of transcriptionally fine populations and a set of transcriptionally distinct populations. We can then take all of those populations as well as the rest of the single cell atlas of the gut and map it to the Visium data of a column from Alison Simmons' paper. And this, um, this data set has the following histology um, where we have a um, column with um, crypts. And importantly, we have one zone which actually contains the lymphoid follicle, which is where various uh, immune cells reside. And through uh, special mapping, we can see that um, overall, we, co we correctly reconstruct the architecture. So we know which cells are, um, we know uh, where to expect colonocytes, where to expect um, intermediate progenitors, transit amplifying cells, um, and we know where to expect B cells. So overall, the mapping is um, consistent with what we know about the teacher. But it, uh, what we can do is we can annotate um, this lymphoid follicle based on histology. And we can use this for a quantitative benchmark. And using this benchmark, we were able to determine that cell location is more accurate than other recently proposed methods at um, transcription at mapping trans specifically transcriptionally fine subpopulations. So other methods, um, especially FCTD, can do quite well on transcriptionally distinct populations. However, it's challenging to map uh, more transcriptionally fine. And looks like we are able to do this. And moreover, um, moreover, we were able to uh, we were able to see that this is this holds on the limb node data set that we are going to look into in this tutorial, as well as pinpoint features of our model. So if you compare uh, the yellow bar for standard cell location with a, a blue bar for cell location that doesn't learn which cell types collocate, you see that the performance of um, the accuracy benefit of cell location is much reduced to the level of other methods. So it's actually the specific innovations in our methods that drive this improvement in sensitivity. So I hope that altogether, this presents a case for using uh, integration of single cell and special transcriptomics to map complex tissues. Um, I didn't really talk about hundreds of cell types, but mouse brain had um, about 60 and um, the GUD atlas had about um, 80, but we also looked at uh, other uh, mapping problems where we indeed map um, more than 100 of cell types. Um, cell location is versatile across special technologies and has modular implementation, which allows you to adapt it to um, future technologies. 
and it can deal with complex single cell RNA seq references. And at this point, I want to jump over to explain the data sets that we are going to work with today. Um, we are going to perform a special mapping of um, this integrated single cell RNA seq reference, which co collects cells from uh, th three studies covering lymph nodes, ent enteric lymph nodes, spleen, and tonsils. And um, this data set has a very good representation of, of the of T cells as well as developing B cells, and um, a, a decent representation of stromal and tissue resident populations of the lymphoid organs. And we are mapping it to the lymph node uh, sample from um, a test data set from 10X. Um, and one of the defining features of the lymph node is that we have um, these follicles uh, and germinal centers. So um, in normal lymph nodes that are not undergoing any, uh, that are not responding to infections have B follicles. But in this, data, uh, in this case, we have a lymph node that is responding to uh, from a certain type of infection. So it has germinal centers. So germinal centers are marked by populations uh, such as follicular dendritic cells. And these follicular dendritic cells are surrounded by a certain population of B cells. And this area is called B follicle. So normally the germinal centers don't exist unless there is an infection. And uh, you see B follicles, in this case, we see both. And the second major area of the lymph node is the T cell zone with um, naive and uh, developing T cells. So this is data set that we are going to look at. And it is exciting because um, through analyzing this data set with cell location, we can then apply downstream analysis um, to identify tissue zones and co-located populations, in which in this case, I'm showing a well-known example of um, two zones of this germinal center area that contain distinct populations of B cells uh, or other cells like T helper, follicular dendritic cells, and um, T helper um, uh, germinal cell center T helper cells and follicular dendritic cells. And these cells guide the development of B cells and have um, are known to be segregated in these two particular areas. All right, so this is the data that we are going to work on. Um, Anna mentioned that we should split questions in two sections. One is theoretical and one uh, more after a, a more tutorial. So now time for questions. Yes, um, we have four questions in the slide already, which we can maybe address now. Um, the first one uh, is on what is the cell to location model accuracy when it is trying to resolve every finely resolved cell type? So for example, if the difference between two cell types may only be reflected in one particular gene. This depends on how highly expressed that particular gene is. Um, so one of the actually interesting examples in this analysis that we did on comparing Yes, actually, no, no, I will give a shorter answer. Uh, it depends on how highly expressed the genes are, both in single cell RNA seq reference and in the special data. Um, and you need to do somewhat careful benchmarks uh, on your data to try and understand whether the cell types are, the cell populations are indeed mapped as expected. And one of the, um, examples I would highlight is, I would come back to is again, um, this fine grained subtypes of astrocytes in the mouse brain. They, they are not different by one gene, but they are different by a few tens of genes. And if you see that cell populations different by a few tens of genes have a very clearly defined differences in their special location, then it gives you some transport in the result, but you can you need to take those cases critically um, and try to understand what's going on. Thanks. 
Nice. Um, the second question would be if you necessarily need a priori cell type annotation to run um, cell to location. In terms of using the method, yes, uh, you have to provide cell to location with, um, you need to tell the method which genes are expressed by every cell type in this in in the data because otherwise how would cell to location know what cell types look like um, but in principle there have been a related ideas proposed to um, use um, de novo decomposition of special data without using the reference however i think that reduces interpretability and um, i might be convinced in the future but uh, for now, I would say that you have to use a reference. Yes, great, thanks. The next question would be if it's correct that the reference data does not need to come from the same sample as the Visium data set. So you it can, is, yeah. Yes, good question. It is indeed uh, correct that you can use single cell atlases from um, the don't match the data. In the mouse brain examples that I mentioned, they actually sectioned the brain said that we use thin adjacent sections for visium and thick sections for doing single nucleus. And I think that this is a very promising approach for a lot of applications, and especially when you generate, when you're generate, when you have to generate new data, um, and when you have to compare samples. But we also applied uh, self location on many many cases, including what we are doing in this tutorial, where uh, the source of the lymph nodes special is completely different from the source of the atlas. But the atlas still contains cells that we actually expect to find in the special data. Great, thanks. The next question would be um, whether you experience differences um, on using Visium compared to GeoMX technologies, um, especially as maybe GeoMX is more homogeneous compared to Visium. So the experience on start to location for this technology. Uh, what I would say is that you need to use a um, modified version of cell to location. Um, uh, you might have issues with it at this moment, but uh, please um, submit GitHub issues if you have any. Um, uh, so you need to use that modified version because indeed um, the properties of uh, nanostring data are, in, are different. Specifically, it has more background uh, binding of, it has more background detection of RNA. Um, in terms of um, the effect of, um, so in uh, nanostring data, you have to select um, the region from which you capture RNA. You have to select the region from which you capture RNA, and this region can have different shapes and different amount of cells. So I think the question is referring to what if these regions are much larger than Visium, that would lead to somewhat more homogeneity. Um, uh, yes, it. Um, I'm not fully certain whether this gives um, makes it hard whether this homogeneity makes it harder to decompose. Um, expression, special expression data into cell types, it's probably a, a more important aspect is detecting enough RNA of relevant genes to actually decompose expression into cell types. Great. This gives some perspective. Great, thanks. The next question would be whether um, gene expression variation within a certain cluster or cell type is considered in the cell to location model. So the way the, uh, the way we address this, um, let me again come back to the B cells that we are going to look into in the tutorial. Um, so the clusters highlighted here, the cells highlighted here are B cells. And in principle, you can just use one category of B cells. And the way you would use heterogeneity within cell populations in cell to location is through providing cell to location with subclusters. So in this case, we provide several subtypes of germinal center B cells and several subtypes of uh, naive and B memory cells. And through providing expression signatures of subtypes, you can map subtypes. Great, thanks. 
Next question would be if it's also um, possible in cell to location to map SM fish images. Um, so not only Visium, but SM fish. Uh, in principle, you can do this. Uh, however, there, there might be methods that are more adapted to deal with single cell resolution fish images. Uh, but there, and possibly, I think that cell to location can be modified to do better at that type of mapping um, as compared to more, uh, to analyzing more genome wide transcriptome data. Um, and in, in, in the one common issue in the single cell um, resolution imaging fish type of methods is that you have very few genes per cell type. And I think that needs to utilize more information about the special data to improve mapping. Um, but I think the methods will come. And uh, one, one thing about benchmarks I want to mention is that there was a recently a benchmark paper that um, looked at application of cell allocation and other methods to um, both decomposing transcriptome-wide expression and in analyzing uh, single molecule fish data. You might find that paper informative, but it's also nice to see that uh, cell allocation for decomposing transcriptome profiles um, is essentially the higher performance compared to other methods is validated independently. Great. Um, one person is mentioning that in the mouse brain example, um, there was some, the astrocytes, some special astrocytes scattered across the visium slide. And how would you then assess if this is noise or if this is real signal in the visium slides? This is a good question. Uh, I would say that um, the way you would assess this is by comparing by histological examination. So let's take example of the stalamic habenular astrocytes. They have a lot of signal in this habenular region, but um, they also have some sporadic signal across some sporadic signal in this white matter area and also in some of the thalamic areas. So the way you would assess whether this is noise or not is by doing histological examination. And in this case, we can uh, identify that this blob of uh, locations are corresponding to a distinct anatomical area. So this gives you more confidence in mapping to this area. And this is indeed where we validate um, uh, the location of this cell population with the samfish. On the other hand, you can also imagine some cell types sporadically distributed within, uh, within the brain, for example, inhibitory neurons that are located just, uh, I mean, you, you see in more sporadic pattern. In this case, you can try to, again, use histological examination and see whether um, it's likely that inhibitory neurons are there. But we also know that inhibitory neurons are supposed to be more or less sporadically distributed as opposed to of fully occupying a certain region. So you need to compare this to both um, histological examination and to prior knowledge about the tissue. Great, thanks. And the next question would be um, regarding the reference because you mentioned that you can, in, um, in theory, use any reference. So would it also be possible to use single cell attack as reference for a cell to location? So the reference for the point of using a reference for self-location is that um, it tells you which genes are expressed in which cell types. Because in the special data, you are measuring the same genes across locations. So you want to be, the, what reference does, it helps you, um, the, the way reference is used is to decompose expression of the same set of genes. So if you have special data, special ataxic data, uh, where instead of genes, you have uh, various accessible regions and you have single cell um, attack data with uh, regions instead of genes, then you can, you can try using cell location. We haven't, that would be interesting to see. Um, 
but the main point I, I, I think I'm trying to make is that you have to measure the same features in both, G, in both the reference and the special data, which uh, in this case is gene expression. And you can try predicting gene expression from accessibility, but that's not, uh, not well validated for use in special mapping. It's more like a research project. Yeah, more like an auto. We have some more questions, but I would propose to address them after the tutorial because some also um, focus on the runtime of cell duplication and the interaction with the um, SCVI models. So I think that will mm -hmm. be clearer after seeing the tutorial. So mm -hmm. um, we can start with the tutorial now. Mm -hmm. um, let me stop sharing and then share the screen again. Give me 20 seconds. So now I will walk you through uh, the main uh, salt allocation tutorial. I think this tutorial is good for explaining how the model is trained and what you can do. But for more practical analysis, it's uh, better to, um, um, I, will, I will explain how it's better to restructure this for um, more practical analysis, especially of multiple special sections. Uh, Again, just to flash a reminder of the data set that we are going to analyze. Um, this is lymph node special and integrated reference of lymphoid organs. So the first thing I would say, uh, and um, I don't know if this will answer the question about integration of salt location to CVI tools, is that salt location is an independent package, but it is powered by CVI tools. And this means that we are essentially using a CVI tools and as a backhand for many of the um, benefits it provides. And uh, this means that some of the issues that you have with the method can be either with more salt location specific um, problems, but it can also be more general questions about analyzing either Visium data or using SCVI tools. And SCVI tools um, has recently joined a project called SCVerse, which aims to group various um, single cell and special genomics, key uh, kind of cornerstone special genomic, uh, single cell and special genomics methods and create a community for discussions. So if you have questions about this at any point, feel free to essentially go to those links. Um, and um, um, hopefully this helps. Um, I will just jump over um, this text, which essentially summarizes what we just discussed during the talk. Before I go into actually uh, just uh, walk through the tutorial, I think it's useful to have this more, to look at this more conceptual uh, diagram of the workflow. So as, as was clear from the talk, cell location needs two inputs. Input number one is single cell or single nucleus or, or reference data, which is an data object. Um, and the second input is a special data which can be either one or multiple batches and can be Visium, SlideSeq, and some other technologies. And this is also and should be a data object. In addition to this information, salt location also requires certain priors about the tissue, that inf about the tissue and the quality of the experiment that inform hyperparameters. And it's in many applications, it's important to change these hyperparameters. And I will explain how to do this, but just want to highlight it. Please note uh, hyperparameters. So another important step is gene selection. Uh, over the years, there have been many ways to select genes. One of the popular ones are variants um, 
based uh, selection, so selecting highly variable genes. Um, my intuition is that highly variable genes are often, um, so selecting highly variable genes often selects against markers of fine-grained subpopulations. So uh, to address uh, this issue, we um, came up with a more heuristic approach to select genes, um, which on one hand, um, selects genes that are expressed by a significant proportion of cells, um, let's say 5%, genes that are detected in more than 5% of cells. But on the other hand, it selects genes that are that have higher expression, so not just above zero, but higher than one. So that on average, there is more than one count detected um, in, um, in cells that are much rarer um, in the data set. And this preserves those more highly expressed markers of rare populations. And so this gene, so, uh, <clears throat> the reference data set, which was filtered according to this gene selection criteria, then goes into reference cell type signature estimation, which is step one. This is a model that you need to train. And there are two versions of this. One is default option, this model that you need to train. And this model is designed for integrating, um, for combining data across technologies in batches, but it mainly focuses on, on UMI-based technologies. And for technologies like SmartSec2, where there isn't uh, unique molecular identifiers to count RNA, I think it's better to just compute average expression in every cluster. So after you uh, after we estimate reference signatures of cell types, we can go on to the main step, uh, and this main step again takes in special data hyperparameters and the reference signatures of cell types, and estimates abundance of cell types. Um, and once you estimated the abundance of cell types, you can run um, downstream analysis tasks such as uh, anything provided in the scan p and squid p packages that you heard about yesterday, um, as well as um, non-negative matrix factorization, which we'll look at um, in this tutorial. Right. So that's an overview of the workflow that we are going to go through now. Now let's go through it. Um, so we start by um, check. So, uh, Currently, I'm using a software environment where cell location was already installed. If it wasn't installed, you need to follow the guidelines on our um, GitHub. Um, so I need to follow the installation instructions here. And also look at uh, some of the issues submitted by other people if you have any issues. Um, here, I have already installed cell location. However, this notebook was made to work on Google Collab. So in Google Collab, when you create a new session, you have to install relevant packages. And it is uh, somewhat tricky to install cell location, to install SCVI tools. So SCVI tools developers made a helper package to do this. So the cell first installs that package and then installs cell location. But in this case, it will just do nothing. And then we load um, the packages relevant for this notebook. Um, and third thing we need to do when doing the analysis is to define the locations of where we are going to store the results and where the data is. Um, so this is what we are doing here. And because we are training two models, one for reference signatures, and one for special mapping, we need to define names for these two um, um, outputs. So the data set that we are using, the special data set that we are using is um, a lymph node data from Tanex. Uh, so um, this data can be easily downloaded using the helper function from um, Scampi. However, in practice, you need to load the data sets, uh, load your own data sets. And the, um, the, the first practical tip is that um, the main way I use social location is by uh, reading 
um, H5 objects from so Ranger output. So thinking about uh, Visium data, reading um, standard um, Space Ranger, not so Ranger, Space Ranger output, and co concatenating distinct samples. And th there is some code examples on our documentation page. Um, in this case, we have just one sample with just one section and salt location needs um, to have information about, um, needs to know the section. So we need to create, we need to essentially create this column, but normally when you're combining your own experiments, this will just get generated. Um, also this data set uses um, gene symbols rather than ensemble gene identifiers for identifying uh, genes. And um, I prefer to, I strongly prefer and strongly encourage you to use ensemble gene identifiers. Um, especially because common workflows often add uh, numbers to make gene symbols unique. And this can essentially make features incompatible, genes incompatible between special and single cell data. For us with ensemble, this wouldn't happen. So we just need to rename uh, um, index of genes to uh, ensemble. And um, one of the nice features of Scanpy is that you can still plot. You don't need to name, um, you, need, you don't need to have var names as uh, readable sim gene symbols because you can actually tell various plotting functions how to plot um, from other columns. And um, I, I just think that this is kind of good to know and helps to choose uh, ensemble over um, others. So one thing to note now is that um, abundance of mitochondrial genes in uh, the single cell and single nucleus data is often related to technical artifacts uh, of, uh, of, nu of mitochondria encoded mitochondrial genes. So I think for special analysis, it's actually important to remove them. And this is what we do now. Uh, we simply save the gene counts uh, to the object, but we remove them from um, from the set of genes. So that's um, what we are doing to the Visium data. Now let's get um, the single cell RNA seq reference. So the single cell RNA seq reference is integrated from several studies and um, provided on um, cell location. Um, data portal. So we will just download it from here, um, but I don't need to download it because it's already here. So I'm just reading that single cell RNA seq reference object. And uh, here again, um, uh, our collaborators who produced this integrated data set used uh, gene symbols. And here again, we rename gene symbols to um, um, to ensemble IDs, to ensemble gene identifiers. And um, so one important point to highlight is that uh, both salt location regression model and uh, salt location itself, the special mapping model itself, they need uh, row counts, untransformed integer counts. Um, salt uh, SCVI tools allow you to specify where in the H5ID object um, these are contained. But in, um, and in these tutorials, uh, row counts are contained in a data um, X slot. So any other slots are not really necessary. And to essentially help call, uh, resist notebook run and call up, I delete this. But this step is not necessary in real analysis. So as I mentioned in the overview, before we actually tra train this model, before we find expression signatures of cell types, it's useful to do permissive, a very permissive gene selection. And hopefully what I mentioned before will become clearer once you see this image. So on this image is a 
2D histogram where color reflects the number of genes and x-axis represents a mean expression uh, of, of a gene in cells where it is detected. So in uh, mean of the non-zero values and y-axis reflects the proportion of cells in which the gene is detected. And in this data set was already filtered using this scheme, but the idea is that you have a lot of genes that have very low, um, that have um, very low non-zero values, let's say just one and never more than one, and are detected in very few cells. And this is the gene that we want to get rid of. On the other hand, we want to keep the genes that are expressed in very few cells, but are highly expressed, but have high count, high non-zero counts. And this is what this workflow um, essentially does. Um, and generally, uh, we aim to select um, somewhere between eight and 16,000 genes, um, but it is very lenient. Um, we notice that some performance drop-offs if you have too many genes and very noisy data. So let's say not, let's not choose 20,000 genes, uh, but uh, I think this workflow does what um, we essentially need. And now we are ready to do the reference signature estimation. So now I, I need to introduce um, the basics of how SCVI tools models operate. If you have used the CVA uh, model itself, you might know, uh, you might start recognizing similar patterns. The first thing you need to do with those models is you need to take the data object and you need to tell SCVI tools, um, in, in, in this case, self location, uh, what are the relevant slots that contain um, those raw counts. And by default, this is just a data reference X, X slot. Um, but you can change this uh, using this setup and data function. For self specifically for self location uh, model, we have these three important columns that we need to provide. The first column we need to provide is what is uh, which column in a data reference OBS, so cell specific um, variable, um, con tells you uh, which cells come from each batch. And for this uh, in cell location regression model, it's very important to give the batch as the next reaction. So cells that were um, put together into uh, droplets and then sequence together. So this is the cells that would normally share background RNA and sequencing budget. That's why it's important to provide that as batch. And the second thing that we need to know uh, that we need to tell us CVI tools um, is we need um, that we need to tell cell location regression model is which column contains cell types. So which column contains um, the populations for which we want to estimate the signatures. And finally, salt location can salt location regression model can correct for certain technical effects in the data, such as um, platform effects, um, three prime, let's say three prime versus five prime technologies, or donor effects. And you can provide those as a list of additional covariates. So if you have more than one covariate, you can just add more than one covariate. So let's do this. And now we are ready to create regression model. For this, we just need to provide the regression model class with uh, 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 prepared and data object. And uh, by the way, after you do set up and data, this object should not be modified and you have to rerun set up and data if you do any modifications. So let's create the model. And what I find useful of what I find often useful for just um, sanity checks is to make sure that the data was set up correctly, that we provided correct inputs to the model, and uh, also check uh, that we haven't deleted all of the genes accidentally. So in this case, we are analyzing a data set of 10,000, roughly 10,000 genes, 73,000 cells, uh, 23 batches, uh, 34 cell populations, and uh, one um, kind of categorical covariate, one technology covariate. And this output just prints you and 
what categories you have, uh, what cell types you have, and useful for um, sanity check. So now we are ready to train the model. Um, so this model training is done with a certain set of hyperparameters. I would highlight a specific hyperparameters. I would highlight that you might need changing um, is um, maximum number of epochs. So epoch is number of passes over uh, the data set. So in this case, we have 73,000 cells and we pass over all 73,000 cells 250 times. But it could be that for more complex data sets where you have more cell populations, uh, more, uh, more complex technical effects, um, larger data, you actually need to train for longer. So you need to run this training step and see, um, uh, look at the key seeds that we will um, look at in a moment and decide whether you need to extend this. Um, generally, you don't need to change batch size, but I just want to highlight that um, the default batch size for this model, which gives better results for this Bayesian um, type of um, regression model um, is much higher than default in the CVI tools. And also we are using all cells as training data. Um, this is all set, uh, determined in defaults in a salt location. So let's start training this. So this training is done in mini batches of uh, 2,500 cells. So it is relatively fast and doesn't need a lot of memory. Um, however, in the interest of time, we are not going to train this model. We are just going to load the models that I already pre-trained. So stop. But do, again, depending on your data size and complexity, you might need to train this for as much as uh, eight hours. This data set is not very uh, hard for this problem. So to uh, to read the uh, model back in, to read the model and um, resulting on data object, we need so we actually actually um, oh, let me change this slightly. So we just set up the data object in. Um, in this step. So our data object is already ready for the model. So what we can do now is we can just load the model. To load the model, you need to use um, this method, give it the location of where it's saved and provide with this and data reference object. So here is CVI tools loaded this model successfully. Um, you might see that it started training, but this is an artifact of how um, probabilistic, so I'm, for salt location uses probabilistic programming language called Pyra to actually define the architecture of the model and for uh, doing variational inference. And this model, this package has, uh, due to how this package works, we need uh, to do one training step on load, but this training step doesn't affect results in it. So it's not safe. And, but normally you would just train the model, wait until it finishes and, um, examine how well the training went. So in this case, if you plot um, the loss function, so this is, um, so the training of this model is done using optimization and optimization minimizes this loss function, um, evidence lower bound loss function, which is used in Bayesian variational inference. So we can plot this loss function over training epochs. And what we are looking for is that this plot should level off. Um, there is some noise in it because uh, stochastic variational inference is uh, stochastic. So you shouldn't expect just continuous line going down, um, but you need to see that the training is leveling off, which it is in this case. But again, for your data set, you need to look at this plot and decide whether you need to continue training or not. And actually to continue training, you can just start this again and this will continue doing more training steps. So we now added a few training steps at the very end here. 
Right. So here we train the model, but we actually need to get reference signatures of cell types. And these reference signatures of cell types are, um, are can need to be extracted from the model. So this model doesn't just estimate a, a single number, it estimates posterior distribution of average gene expression in every cell type. So we need to export this posterior and there are a few hyperparameters for this step, which I want to highlight. One is number of samples from the posterior distribution. The more samples you have, the more accurate average and standard deviation you get. But on the other hand, um, the more samples, the more higher memory requirement. And in this particular case, this can still run on Google Club. And the second one is that this posterior sampling can be done in mini batches, which is what we are doing now again, um, and on GPU to make it faster. All right. So normally, uh, when we are doing this posterior ex export, we are also saving the model and saving then data object with exported posterior uh, and other parameters of the model. But here, because we already saved the model, I don't want to overwrite it. So I will comment it out. We will just generate samples from the posterior to get um, results. So in addition to, uh, now let's go to more QC plots. So in addition to just looking at the elbow and how it changes, how training, uh, how loss function changes over training, uh, there are two more important QCs as we defined. Um, one QC compares uh, observed while RNA counts in the data to um, the posterior predictive value of the model. So this is how many counts are in each cell in, uh, for each gene in um, this data set. And what you want to see is uh, this type of diagonal um, to the histogram. It's, it, it's, it is quite noisy because the data is overspersed. But if you see some weird um, uh, results like high density of cells in here, so predictions of high count when you actually have zero count, or if you see any kind of big difference from this plot, this would suggest some issues. And uh, the second QC is uh, look not just at the RNA counts in the data, but compare hard coded computation of mean expression of every gene in every cluster to what this model estimated. And normally you need to see again the diagonal with some noise around it accounting for the fact that this model actually corrects for batch effects, whereas computing average doesn't. But again, if you see very large differences here, this can suggest issues. And um, yeah, we just loaded the model, but in principle, after training and after saving and data object, you can load the model like this. Yes, yeah, so in this case, QC look good. So we can just proceed to extract reference cell type signatures. Um, and posterior export step normally saves them in one of the two locations. Location number one is varm slot. And the, uh, this parameter is called means, so posterior means, and per cluster mu of g is um, a per cluster average expression, so for every cluster f and every gene g. So I'm trying to relate this to the math and describe it in the paper. But sometimes uh, this saving doesn't work, so it can be just saved as columns in undata var, and this step just extracts that. And one important point is that um, all parameters of the model, as well as gene names, cell names, and names of cell types, are saved in a data reference, a data ref .uns slot, um, unstructured slot, under this model mod key, and, and here we save factor names, which are essentially cell type names, but also other important parts of the model that um, you, you might be interested in examining, but there's more advanced use cases. So now let's we'll just extract the signatures. We extract them as a data frame. This data frame contains cell types and columns and genes and rows. And um, this finalizes the reference signature estimation. And now we can just proceed to the special mapping. So the first thing to do 
uh, now is to make sure that the reference signatures, so this inf average, um, inf other um, data frame has exactly the same set of genes as the undata Visium object. And we can do this by essentially uh, taking intersect of um, var names and index of this data frame, and then filtering both undata object and um, inferred averages. And it's important to get this step correctly um, for obvious reasons. So we just do the subsetting and then we need to register and data object again the self, but now not with regression model, but with self location model. So we register the Visium object and data Visium object with self location model. And unlike a regression model, self location doesn't need a lot of inputs. But it, the main thing it needs to know is a batch key. So for um, Visium data, this is the square capture area. Or if you have multiple sections, let's say two sections from two donors in the Visium capture area, that would be um, um, those distinct Visium sections within one area. And the presentation is similar to um, how I think about batches in a uh, single cellular NASIC data. Um, that this should be the locations in the special data, this should be the locations that share free floating RNA and share. Um, so, and, and the share soup free floating RNA and the share um, uh, sequencing budget. And this is important because self location model corrects for experiment for batch specific uh, sequencing budget as well as for. Um, Batch specific variants and batch specific batch specific noise, so batch specific unexplained variants, and batch specific background counts. So it's important to tell self location this information. Okay. Yes. So now we proceed to the next step, which is selecting those two hyperparameters that I mentioned. So there are two hyperparameters. One is, sorry, one is number of cells per location and another is detection alpha. So these two hyperparameters control, um, the first hyperparameter, is uh, hyperparameter tells the model um, what is the expected cell abundance. So how many uh, cells do you expect to see at every location in the tissue? And this number is generally different for these different tissues, and it can be estimated from paired histology images. Uh, and if paired histology images are too bad, as in this case, we can take histology images of um, other lymph nodes and get a good guesstimate, get a good uh, approximate value of cell number which in this case is about 30. So we use N cells per location, per location 30. In the mouse brain, this number is uh, more around eight. And in some tissues, like actually the human brain, we have very few uh, cells in each location. So this number is more um, along the lines of one or two. However, uh, we did some, some benchmarks in the paper and we showed that while this parameter is useful, it's not essential for actually estimating um, cell proportions correctly. So you can be, um, so this number is just an approximation rather than, uh, you don't have to provide a very exact number here. So I actually want to open the flow diagrams that we recommend for thinking about these hyperparameters. So again, we have two. Um, this uh, plot, uh, this diagram essentially deals with how you uh, select this number of cells per location parameter. Um, I roughly discuss what it is, uh, but when you're doing your analysis, please have a look and essentially go through steps and pick the number. Uh, more importantly, I think for uh, uh, accuracy in um, a lot of the, uh, human data sets that have um, high technical variability within the slide, um, we need to select this detection alpha parameter. So what does it do? Detection alpha parameter 
controls. Um, let me come back for a second to, um, to the slides. So uh, I was explaining cell location. I mentioned that we are uh, summing up contributions of cell types, applying technology normalization, additive background, and then applying this per, per location normalization. So what this per location normalization does is account for technical differences between spots, between locations. And however, we notice that this value needs to be quite strongly regularized to avoid over normalization, essentially reduction in accuracy. And this is again possible to regularize using Bayesian framework. Um, this parameter has a prior, a batch specific prior. That's how we account for batch specific uh, sequencing budget. But within batch, the variation is regularized. And this is the goal of this um, AY parameter. So it's called AY in, um, um, in, the, in the paper. Um, and detection alpha in the method, in, in uh, implementation. So in this case, you need to ask yourself whether you observe strong within batch variation in total or in account. And this variation can be in principle biological, but you need to compare um, it to histology and essentially ask uh, whether this variation corresponds to histological features of TG or not. And in the mouse brain in our paper, uh, it doesn't correspond. It's cor a variation in total or na count nicely corresponds to areas of the brain. So we need to use strict regularization. However, for a lot of tissues that um, I have worked with um, since um, starting to, uh, work, uh, to work on this method, we actually need to use less strict regularization, so um, alpha 20. And initially we use this as default, but a lot of the, the data sets seem to have within batch variation. So it is quite important to check this. So, all right. So now we are ready to pick those two hyperparameters. So again, in this data set, we actually can use high um, strength of regularization of this normalization parameter. But I think that a default value in principle, I think that in principle, you should try both values and see which gives you more correct results um, using some orthogonal measures like histological examination. Mm -hmm. But in many cases, a better default is actually uh, re relaxed regularization. So let's create the model and again, do some, um, do some sanity checks on to view this on data setup. So in this case, we have 4,000 locations. SVI tools just uses a single name, so it's called cells here. Uh, and we have 10,000 genes, one batch. So that's all good. We are now ready to train. So one important difference between cells location and regression model and also CVI tools and how people and train models generally is that cell to location needs to be trained on full data. And um, well, we are, so what this means is that in every training step, cell to location needs to see all locations, all 4,000 locations, in this case, not a mini batch of 100 locations. And um, this is because to um, improve accuracy, uh, this is because, uh, this essentially improves accuracy compared to mini batch training. Um, one intuition for this is that we are estimating location specific cell abundance, location specific normalization. And if you train in mini batches of locations, you're, you're making the problem harder. Um, so in practice, we recommend using exclusively um, full data training um, because this gives you the accuracy benefits. We are also working on neural network based um, what's called amortized inference approach for approximating cell abundance. But and we have some promising results, but so far we don't have, um, it doesn't reach the same accuracy as uh, training on full data. So we, uh, we don't recommend it yet, but uh, follow the space. And we also need to train uh, this model on all locations because we need to know cell abundance in all locations. And again, we can start training. Um, this data set is quite small and I'm using a very fast GPU. So training is um, quite 
fast, 30 minutes. Um, on the Google Colab, it will be uh, two hours. And uh, as data size increases, you need both larger GPUs to feed the data into the GPU, but you also, it, the training will also take more time. But again, the benefit of doing the training this way is improved accuracy. Again, we don't have half an hour to wait, so we can just uh, stop this and load um, already uh, trained model. So the model loading is done in exactly in pretty much exactly the same way as um, um, regression model. Just use this method, and in this case, I'm not providing just registered um, object, but I'm actually loading object that already has results. Uh, um, sometimes, if you stop training in the middle. Um, Drupyter notebook glitches and shows this, which is what is happening here. Okay, so the model is loaded. Um, again, in this case, uh, we already, uh, so in this case, we already trained the model and we saved it. So I'm not going to save this again. And uh, I also need to comment this. But this step is again similar to how to what we just did for the regression model. So here we need to export posterior of the cell abundance. And what posterior distribution means is that you have both uh, mean of the posterior distribution, the standard deviation, as well as 5% and 95% quantiles. So this is what this function does. And it computes those quantiles and um, the mean based on posterior samples. Um, there is also a way to compute quantiles and the median directly. And this is shown at the, uh, later in the notebook is in, in the advanced section, uh, which we will not examine today, but you can go into this. And uh, one difference uh, to the previous step is that here we are using all cells as batch. And also uh, this step takes a few seconds. Yes, yeah, this step, step takes a few seconds. So I can just try it. Um, and more like half a minute. Uh, hey, Vitaly, which... maybe two more minutes, then we have, um, and we can wrap and have maybe a few more questions because we need to have a rough cut mm -hmm. at half past for Johanna to present mm -hmm. the closing talk. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we exported uh, cell abundance parameters and now we can go on to um, first examine uh, quality control. So in this case, we, um, we are suggesting two quality controls. One is similar to the regression model where we need to compare detected counts of RNA of every gene in every location to, uh, the, to the output of the model. So this output of the model is how cell type signatures and various technical factors reconstruct this. And this, in this case, we have very good reconstruction. Also, when you're integrating multiple batches, it's useful to look at the output described here. Um, this will, um, yeah, feel free to ask questions in, in various forums and in uh, this media. And finally, we are ready to both visualize um, the results, uh, but also we are ready for the downstream analysis. And I will just briefly flash what those downstream analyses are and then finish off on that. So 25 minutes. Um, so the, the main presentation of cell location results is um, abundance of uh, each of the cell types at every special location. And this abundance is expected number of cells. And this is roughly, this roughly corresponds to what we would expect. So B cyclin cells and B naive cells are highly abundant, whereas follicular dendritic cells and um, German on cell central T helper cells are more rare. So we see this difference in numbers. And this difference in numbers is more accurate if you regularize normalization stronger. Um, which is why we uh, initially chose a different default for normalization regularization. Uh, in addition to standard scanpy visualization, we also provide a custom plotter for 
uh, multicolor maps where you can show several cell types at once using different color. And the alpha, the, um, the transparency of the color represents cell abundance in again similar way as above. And then we um, can do several ways of downstream analysis. One of which is about identifying, um, let me just switch off to a notebook where this is pre-computed. So the first step is about identifying clusters of visium spots that correspond to distinct anatomical areas. And to get the right number of clusters, you again need to compare these clusters histologically to the anatomy of the tissue. The second step is about identifying uh, cellular compartments or tissue zones using non-negative matrix factorization. Um, this is what we present in the paper. Uh, this is what I used to motivate um, uh, presenting this example. So identifying tissue zones. And the difference between clusters and tissue zones is that tissue zones uh, can overlap specially. And this happens because Visium captures multiple cells in the same location. And finally, I just want to mention one very exciting application, um, one very exciting application, which is estimating per cell type expression of every gene in the special data, because this allows you to essentially get uh, to essentially use methods like NSAM for looking at cell, cell communication using Visium data. And what this means is that we can take expression of a gene like CD3, which is a T cell marker, and we can um, ask the model to allocate exp every count of the observed count to one of the cell types in the data. And um, so two cell types that I want to mention are naive T cells, which are located here, and follicular uh, T cells that are located in the germinal centers. So you can see that the model can decompose these counts into a cell type specific expression. On the other hand, B cells don't express this gene, so they don't get any CD3 allocation. So that's a very exciting direction, which uh, I hope uh, can get more attention in the future. And then also note advanced use uh, if you hit, uh, if you find that useful. So yeah, thank you very much everyone for attention. Hope this explains how to use our method better. And uh, sorry for taking a bit more time than expected. No, I think it's fine. It was really great. Um, maybe we can address a few questions. I will um, post the rest of the questions which remain open at 4.30 in the Zulip. So maybe Vitaly can answer them in the Zulip and people can continue raising questions there. One question that got um, the most upvotes was, would you also consider removing ribosomal genes in the pre-processing? Uh, we considered this in several examples, actually, including this limp node mapping. Um, I would say no, because um, different cell types differ in the amount of ribosomal genes. For example, activated T and B cells have more need for uh, producing protein, so they would have higher expression of um, ribosomal protein genes. So this is useful information for mapping. Uh, and uh, you can try doing this, but you can need to think really carefully about interpretation. Great, thanks. The second question we maybe can address is, what is the minimum number of cells within a cell type you would need to run cell to location? We didn't do extensive benchmarks, but in the data sets that we tried, uh, we went as low uh, as to use eight cells. Uh, eight cells in uh, 10x data, and uh, I think three or five cells in SmartSeq2 data of the brain. But SmartSeq2 ha obviously has higher depth than um, 10x. So you can stretch this, but you need to keep in mind that when you have more cells, you have more accurate estimate of average expression of the genes in this cell type. So um, if you see suspicious mapping, then you need to, to consider this, uh, but looks like you can go quite low. Right. And maybe the last one. So can you use an 
um, normal reference, so an undiseased version of a reference data set for then a diseased case in the visium slice? Or do you need the same biological system with the same um, permutation, so to say? So the cells in the reference should be sufficiently similar to cells in the special data that this analysis makes sense. Uh, like you wouldn't want to map gut to the brain data. But um, so this is like an absurd example. However, if disease changes the state of the tissue so much that almost all cell states are different, then you might have uh, issues with mapping. Uh, however, we also, uh, uh, on the other hand, if the changes in disease revolve around changes in a small number of cell populations, then it is absolutely fine. And we actually use this when we were testing nanostring data. Um, so um, when we are testing cell location for nanostring data, uh, but you need to, again, uh, think about this carefully. And one of the exciting directions in that case is that you can try to estimate expression of uh, disease specific expression using the approach that I just mentioned in the last few minutes. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Vitaly. I will add the remaining open questions to the Zulip, so maybe you can have a look there. And, and now I'm very happy to announce our closing speaker for the workshop. Um, it's been really interesting two days. Um, and we will now hear Johanna Klukhammer on her opinions where the spatial omics field will move to in the future. And um, yes, looking forward to your talk. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Can you see my presentation? Yes, I can see it. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. I, I could just um, join the second day, not the first, but what I've seen is really great. Like, congrats to this awesome um, workshop. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Johanna Klukhammer. I just started my lab for systems immunology at the Gene Center here in, in Munich. And before that, I was a postdoc with Aviv Regev, where I got, the got a chance to really dig into um, spatial transcriptomics. Um, so in my brief closing talk, I tried to really stick to what the organizers asked me to talk about, an introduction to my methods and an outline of where the field is moving according to me. And uh, the according to me is really important. Um, because it's um, very hard to be completely unbiased here. Um, so take it with a grain of salt and just see it, um, see everything in, as in the context of my, you know, my upbringing, basically. Um, okay. Okay, so where's the field moving? I think um, spatial transcriptomics is often seen as some what like the natural successor of single cell transcriptomics. And so it's tempting to look at single cell transcriptomics to predict how spatial um, transcriptomics will move. And indeed, I'd say that both fields roughly follow the same um, steps um, that are successively iterated. So first, there are like technical advances that produce data of increasing quantity and quality. And then there's improvement in data analysis with general and specific tools being developed in dependence of what information um, is available in these um, data that are being produced. And finally, um, these analysis lead to insight, um, some like a, a fundamentally new understanding about a system like a new cell type um, being functionally characterized as a, as a somewhat trivial um, example. Um, but importantly, this last step is actually a two-way street um, because fundamental insight into a system itself can and should also lead to um, the development of new analysis. And so while, while it seems um, that for single cell transcriptomics, the technology step is quite settled and innovation now mostly happens between analysis and in insight. For spatial transcriptomics, the technology step is still extremely active. And this is um, basically where some fundamental differences start. So for, for spatial transcriptomics, there's not only strong sequencing based methods, but also very promising Im imaging based methods and I think um, there will be a coexistence for quite some time, maybe forever, but forever is a very long time. Um, so, and also in spatial transcript, uh, for 
Also, spatial transcriptomics analysis is not only um, informed by single cell transcriptomics, but also by spatial proteomics, um, which had a bit of a head start, especially for, for fixed um, clinical samples. And so this very nice, but already terribly outdated graphic from, um, from a review that was published last year um, illustrates the, the zoo of spatial transcriptomics method. And looking at the most recent um, development, the trajectory clearly goes towards higher numbers of measured features, so, such as genes, for example, or and observations um, such as cells um, on, the, on the X axis. And so one thing that will probably happen more in future or sh should probably happen more in future, I'm not sure if it's going to happen because it's terribly expensive, um, are, are systematic comparisons between um, methods just to figure out which methods uh, to use for certain questions. Um, and as part of the Human Tumor Atlas pilot project, um, we are systematically comparing three spatial transcriptomics methods, LightSeq, MERFISH, and XSeq, and one spatial proteomics method and codex in consecutive sections of metastatic breast cancer and biopsies. And uh, so here the color represents cell type um, transferred from matching single nucleus RNA-seq um, data. And, a, a, um, and apart from differences in measurement area, there's also quite, um, it's also quite apparent how um, only the segmented version of MERFISH seems to properly um, cluster the cells um, or allow to cluster the cells in a similar way as we're used to for, uh, from single cell RNA-seq, so here. Um, this has different reasons or different um, for different methods. It, the reason for this um, non-clustering um, is different um, and, and it relates to convolved measurements. Um, to sensitivity and specificity issues. And it's relevant because being able to clearly cluster observations is at the moment crucial for de novo um, reference-free um, cell type annotation. And so in, in terms of technology, there's a lot um, to optimize beyond increasing number of, of measured features and observations. So when increasing the number of features, the quality of measurement, um, sensitivity and specificity is really important. When increasing the number of observations, it's also important at what resolution um, they are measured, basically. Um, and finally, finally, the measurement, the measurement area and dimensions are important as well as, as measured modality. So going into the, the multi-modality. Um, area. And um, to illustrate, just earlier this month, um, a new method called StereoSeq um, was published um, like in, in, a, in a journal after being on, on bioarchive bio for a bit. Um, and StereoSeq profiles the whole transcriptome at an unprecedented combination of high sensitivity, resolution, and measurement area, um, at least so that's what the paper suggests. I, I haven't had a chance to look uh, at the data yet. And this I also found to be very important to actually look at the data always. And so these technology related features are important because in a sense, they determine the analysis, spe uh, specifically analysis targeted at making the data better or even usable. I guess we've just um, very nicely seen um, from, from Vitalis too, basically without something like this, these, um, these convoluted measurements are very hard to use for, for anything um, biology related, basically. Um, so for example, analysis, um, analysis methods for um, feature reconstruction, um, they impute expression, um, expression for genes that were not measured in a targeted method or due to low sensitivity. Um, and another task here is to deal with, with background signals in data with low specificity. Um, similarly, anas analysis methods um, for, are for, um, we need for cell reconstruction, 
like for example, um, cell to location. So here we have the convolution methods where multiple cells are measured um, in the same observation and segmentation methods when single, molecule, uh, single molecules are actually measured. And finally, analysis um, methods for regionization and integration um, are needed to leverage large measurement areas and um, complementary modalities. Um, and here, for example, also something like eggplant that you've seen before would, you know, is, is relevant or is a very good example. And again, to illustrate, just to illustrate, and just last week, um, a nice benchmark came out comparing a large number of tools for the first two tasks. So to predict um, undetected transcripts um, and for cell type deconvolution. And to tackle um, these and other crucial tasks in a unified manner, we're developing a computational framework, framework called TACO, um, which is short for transfer of annotations to cells and their combinations. Um, and it's based on Undata and so plays nicely with ScanPy and SquidPy. And it features boosters that enhance the actual annotation methods. Um, it has visualization tools and downstream analysis tools, all centered around one core um, or core annotation method or core annotation methods, actually. Um, so TACO natively comes with an optimal transport based annotation method. Uh, which is extremely fast and memory efficient. For example, for one slide seek pack, it needs less than two gigabytes of RAM and less than one minute on a single uh, on a single CPU core. So it's really fast and memory efficient. Um, so while the trend seems to go in the direction of resource intense methods, we're hoping to offer um, kind of a lightweight alternative alternative here. Um, so notably, the way the TACO is built, um, the core annotation methods can also be really easily exchanged. So for example, you can run it, uh, you can run RCTD or Tangram um, within this framework and, and then combine, combine the results or combine what you get out of that with the other features from, from TACO. Um, among the downstream analysis, um, TACO has optimized versions of regionization, um, co-occurrence co analysis, and enrichment analysis, while, while taking into account the compositional nature of, of the data. Um, we also have two not-so-standard analysis. Um, one is the actual splitting of mixed expression profiles into their um, constituent cell type-specific profiles. Um, here demonstrated on artificially mixed single cell RNA seq data. So in the top panel, um, the, it's, it's the original single cell RNA seq data, and then um, the in silico mixtures of these profiles simulating, for example, slide seq beeps. Um, and then finally, the new profiles obtained after distributing the UMIs to new cell type and um, specific profiles. Um, and we have single molecule annotation um, that can be used for data-driven segmentation in data with um, single molecule resolution, such as MERFish or OSMFish, like in this um, example of mouse brain here, where the strategy leads to better um, recovery of several cell types, but especially um, astrocytes, um, which are here in orange. Um, so in summary, TACO is very fast and resource friendly and generally applicable. Um, that's also important. It's not only limited to spatial data, but um, can also be used for other situations that profit from um, compositional annotations, um, such as, for example, um, single cell expression data um, of a differentiating system. Um, and it has this nice, these nice downstream analysis that can also be used together with other um, annotation methods. Um, the preprint is coming out any time now, um, but you can already use TACO. It's on GitHub and, and Simon, who, who's, who's spearheading this together with Noah, um, put, uh, already um, put together a nice, nice documentation. So check it out if you're, you're interested. And, but 
Um, these data augmenting analysis, such as, for example, the cell type deconvolution or um, segmentation, are just the first step. In the second step, we also need uh, we also need analysis that bring us more towards insight. And um, some of those are also implemented in TACO as well as several other, other tools. Um, and so here we have those methods that focus on features again, assessing, for example, spatial co-regulation um, of genes, also at subcellular resolution, if that's in the data, um, basically. And we have those methods that focus on cells um, assessing co-localization and neighborhoods um, or, or direct signaling and communication between cells. Um, these bring us to interesting obs observations um, and more often than not to new hypotheses. But the big challenge is to actually get from here to true insight and understanding um, by, um, how, by, sh by showing why and how um, an observation is is actually relevant for the studied system. And so this difficulty um, of this step um, from observation to insight um, is also illustrated in this somewhat self-critical caricature um, called types of um, single cell sequencing papers um, with one of the types being um, with the title, basically it turns out that spatial transcriptomics brings us no closer to actually um, curing disease. And so, of course, curing disease is not the only possible indication of true insight, but I'd say it's a very worthy one, and, and at least for me and for my lab, um, this is what we're after or what we're hoping to achieve. Um, and I think many in, in the community share this feeling that there's a lot more potential in, in these data, especially as they're improving um, so much in, in such fast time. Um, then is currently really being leveraged. And this, of course, calls for even more in, in innovative an analysis. And how to get there is not, um, not an easy question. Um, but for our lab, we're working um, on shifting analysis from observational, more in the direction um, of functional, by integrating as much clinical um, or generally author orthogonal um, data as possible, and also by looking at perturbable um, systems such as organoids. Um, and we're learning to ask the right questions, hopefully, um, by working closely together with pathologists who have actually used forms of spatial molecular data uh, for decades in clinical decision making. So there we already have this um, direct link, basically. Um, and with this, I'm uh, with these thoughts. I'm I'm at the end, and I, it just remains to thank um, the many people I've had the pleasure to work with on on these topics in the past couple of years. And um, finally, I want to again thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak here, um, and thank you for for your attentions. We'd be happy to take questions and discuss. Thank you, Hannah, for this nice insights. Um, I saw that Vitaly actually um, posted a few questions and comments, and maybe Vitaly, you can address them directly and unmute yourself. Would be nice. Uh, yeah, one comment is actually that it's important to highlight that um, even as special resolution increases, so examples that you showed has um, kind of beautiful special resolution, but um, even in those cases, even in SlideSeq, you still capture RNA from multiple cells. And this, is, this means that uh, you have to do this mixture decomposition for a long time to come. And it's nice to see that you're also thinking about it this way. So that's, that's a comment. Um, but a question is more like, uh, not necessarily to you, but in general to the community is um, about the balance between high sensitivity or high model expressivity. So let's say uh, we can have models that have, that all, uh, enable high number of downstream applications, either through sensitivity or because they provide more informative inputs. So let's say thinking about a CVI uh, for integration versus graph level integration. So you can have those benefits, sensitivity or uh, the downstream tasks enabled. But on the other hand, uh, you can have high um, improved memory or runtime efficiency. 
And um, I think the question to, to you in the community is how should we balance between them? And because I see that there was a lot of push over the past many years for um, memory and time efficiency, but not so much for um, uh, the, the scales are tipped strongly towards, towards computational efficiency. Um, maybe I can just comment a, a little bit. Um, so I mean, so we so in in the preprint we're we're showing that basically we're not losing like we're of course benchmarking against um, known methods, um, and we don't like at least for as far as we looked at we're not worse, <laughs> but we're much faster. Um, I I wouldn't say necessarily that we're we're better. So here it was clearly not the the goal. To be better, uh, it's not. Yes, yeah, sorry. It's not a criticism of your method. This is more like I, I think that this is a general trend. Yeah, so. um, I just. I mean, I can just maybe say it from from our perspective or so why we thought. I mean, what what we've seen is that a lot of methods actually um, that that came out recently used a lot of memory and and basically say, okay, we have these GPUs now, um, and with them we can we can do great things, and also inspired by by deep learning by the deep learning field and so on. Um, that the, the trend went a little bit in this, and this is, I think, very very valid. So we have this technology, so we can we can also use it. Um, but some what what we found is that sometimes it's just super useful to to do things quickly with high, like with with high speed. You can you, you just have much more throughput. Basically, you can try, you can test more different things, and you get kind of feedback faster and so on. So I, I think it's it's kind of complementary. And um, what we what we've also thought that not everybody is so fortunate to have access to GPU computing, even if there's like CoLab and there's all these resources that are free and that you can use, then they're usually memory limited and so on. So we just thought it's also a nice feature or so to just have something compl complementary. Um, so to answer your question more specifically, um, I, I totally think there's absolutely space and necessity for, for both. So for some things you, maybe you can, you can actually reach higher, um, you know, higher specificity and sensitivity with more computational power. And then you, you have your, your system or your interest and it's really worth it. And then you, you invest those resources. But I think oftentimes maybe you're also fine with a little bit less sensitivity and specificity. And then you can also do great research even if you don't have these resources, for example. Good point. Actually, I just wanted to briefly respond to this. I think a lot of workflows that were mentioned today, including social location yesterday, um, can be uh, like you can change parameters to train things much more quickly. So I, I, mm -hmm. yeah, I agree with your point that it's very useful to be able to iterate. Um, and let's say uh, for, from the perspective of salt location, you can train salt location with higher learning rates for shorter time, and you will get kind of also uh, speed ups and so on. Great, thanks. We have one additional question from the community um, about your tool. So they were asking if you could tell a little bit more about your cell um, segmentation module. Is it similar to Bezor um, from Kartenko Lab or um, where are the differences? We, com we, we did compare to, to Bezor. Um, it, it compares favorably, basically. I, I wouldn't say again that it's, that it's a lot um, better. It's also, um, I mean, yeah, you have to then look at, at the preprint when it's out and decide for yourself, but it's definitely very fast and it, um, and it gives um, good results. And this, the strategy is really to, uh, basically the, the, the strategy behind it is that it, because this um, OT-based annotation is, is so fast, you can basically do several rounds of somewhat random spatial binning, and then in, in those assign um, cell types to those uh, small tiny bins and assign thereby also cell types to single molecules basically and you just do this so often um, that in the end you have a good statistic on it which in which cell 
in which cell, cell type basically you categorize a certain certain transcript in a certain location. So it's not it's not said that it has to be um, this a certain transcript type or species doesn't have to be the same cell type everywhere. It depends on on its context. Great, thank you. I think uh, Fabian raised his hands. Yeah, hi, hi Johanna. Um, thanks for a nice presentation. I really like this this last one. I think it's a really good point that you're making there. Uh, like this back and forth between a model and, and the analysis. But the one thing that I usually don't put on, on, on these and sort of don't think so much about is that you actually put in the pathologist in particular, right? Because in many cases, you know, we have like all these correlation patterns from different areas, but I think pathology is, is the, 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 maybe the discipline we, we want to improve on most. And so I'm wondering what you could maybe comment there. Do you think we, I mean, it's like an old thing, right? I mean, pathology has been around for so much. Do you think maybe really this whole morphometric aspect which, you know, on the cellular level, sometimes people do a lot from h &E, but maybe sort of also larger scale. You think we should take this up more? Um, what, what, what's, your, what's your gut feeling there? You know, where because I guess we're all like looking at what could be like one of the next big, big things. And, and I think, you know, the spot-based stuff that you were mentioning with Murphy's obviously, I think is a very clear um, sort of exploding thing. But yeah, how, how about these other modalities or this other information, maybe also these larger scale regions and, and so on that could mm -hmm. be used? Did you see that something we should maybe go in more, we should leave to the, compu to the computer vision people and sort of build an interface? What, what's your take there? Yeah, no, I, I totally think that, I mean, I, I'm not sure I understood your question very precisely, but that's the reason we're so interested in. I mean, we're, I, I'm not saying we're doing a very good job at it yet. We're just starting out, but it's it's really something that I identified as as where we want to where we want to go. And and the, the specific reason is is because it it allows us kind of an easy link to medical relevance because the pathologists like the like the things they're looking at, you can you can kind of be arrogant and say, yeah, but that's so low dimensional that they're just looking at five genes or something like that, or they're just looking at how a cell is shaped or how many cells you have there. But if you think about it, that's exactly the same questions or so that, that we're also kind of working on just in a, in a much higher scale. But our problem is then to link it back to medical relevance, for example. So I, 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 th I think if, if we basically learn from them and and really take their you know their their features or so that they found um, over I don't know sixty years or so to be medically relevant um, and really try to link them back or kind of detect them or describe them um, more efficiently and maybe with more precision and importantly they have all these hierarchies and so on right they have like all these very detailed classification yeah. kind of decision trees even right yeah I was and, thinking and this, yeah. if we could do this more or to like help them to really do it in a good way and automatically like with with computer aid using the high dimensional data that we that we now have um I think that could really really advance how how we're doing medicine or how how they are doing medicine I mean we're not really doing it and, and for um, me kind of computation pathology is sort of a bit of a separate discipline because you know they are not sort of looking multimodal yet yeah but, but I agree, you have, you have a point. Maybe this needs to go together. Thank you yeah. so much. We have one more additional question on your tour um, on how you assessed the accuracy um, of your segmentation for images without ground truth um, label information. That's a good um, question. Basically, we I mean, we did somewhat have ground truth information um, from the original publication. So there they did kind of manual segmentation basically and um, and annotation that, that's based, that was basically the upper image I showed where then they have extremely high sensitivity, uh, no, no it is extremely high specificity basically um, where they, they basically say, if we can segment something nicely, then we keep the cell. But if we can't segment it nicely, then we lose the cell. And so what, it, what they annotated we kind of assumed as ground truth or as true, but what they didn't annotate, we just kind of ignored and, and the advantage of what we see in, with our methods and with Bayser, um, by the way, too. So Bayser also does a good job in annotating these things that 
um, could not be annotated or could not be annotated or were not trusted in, in a sense in the in the manual annotation. And we see this. This is a, a phenomenon that we see also in in our Murfish data from the metastatic breast cancer data set that you just lose so many you lose so many really good reads um, or measurements um, with the with the manual segmentation because often that they overlap and so on. But computationally, you can still tease them apart basically. Great, thank you. And then we have Giovanni, um, maybe as a last question before I hand over. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Aldana. Th thank you, Giovanna, for the great talk. That was, was very interesting. Um, actually, I want to go back to what you were discussing with Fabio with respect to also clinical aspect, clinical applications of these things. And uh, related to the, the, the slides on the tumor atlas network, where you compare annotations of cells between uh, single cell sick and uh, a bunch of special technologies. Uh, super interesting, by the way, I, I don't think I've ever seen such a, um, clear evaluations of the technology in terms of cell type uh, annotations. Uh, very interesting. I was wondering, in my opinion, there is another level of uh, looking at this, which is the, the field of view, the, the size of the tissue that the technology captures, right? And, and so again, there, I guess, then there, there is introduced a trade-off between uh, how highly resolved you can go in terms of uh, both cell level and, um, identification, so can we segment the cells? Uh, but also the multiplexing, right? So how many genes you can get in order to then annotate these cells. Um, and then there is the size of the actual tissue. Is so do you have, uh, I mean, from, from that comparison, for instance, it looks like Murphy seems very, very promising. And I guess the field of view, the area measure is also pretty large. Do you have any insight on these and any maybe technology that you think is, is particularly powerful for this specific, uh, uh, again, clinical application? So wanting to, to, to sample large areas of, of, the, of the tissue? Yeah, I can just, I mean, this is, of course, now again, um, referring to my disclaimer at the beginning where I'm extremely biased. So um, I like Murfish a lot. And, and in fact, for the, the follow up of this um, kind of broad, um, just look at everything project that we have here for the HTAP, um, where we more specifically wanted to look into um, certain um, breast cancer metastasis in an immunotherapy context. Um, basically, we we decided to go for Murfish. Like we decided on one method, and and we chose Murfish. Um, we Murfish has quite a lot of genes. So the the data that I'm showing is about 300 um, genes that can be profiled. And we were super surprised. I mean, we we put a lot of effort really in selecting um, those genes, and that was. Um, that we, we had to do that um, before um, Fabian's tools um, were available and so on. So we really had to, to think very, very hard and, and we went to, went to great lengths. But in the end, I think our probes turned out really well because um, it, it turned out that they allowed us to identify cell types that we hadn't even expected, um, basically. So we saw in these, in these Murfish data, we, we just saw some clusters. And when we did the automatic annotation, and in fact, you can also see it in what I showed, um, that they had a little, like we had several classes, for example, annotated as T cells, but they were um, clearly separate. So we looked a little bit closer and then we could, we looked at the genes and through those genes that were expressed there, we could see that it was actually other cell types that were just not found in the reference. So it basically assigned the closest thing um, it could sign. Um, same for hepatocytes, for example. So we had not put in any gene specifically for hepatocytes, um, thinking that it's a site specific um, thing and would probably not be relevant across all samples. Um, we had not put it in, but it turned out that we can very nicely identify hepatocytes, nevertheless. Um, and and so all of this taken together, and I mean the like the one big selling point for for Murfish, I, I really at the moment is really this this incredible um, sensitivity and specificity um, of of the measurements. This is I, I haven't really seen it in, in other data yet. But I mean, of course, I haven't looked at all. But apart from these, we've looked at a couple of, um, of others. And yeah, so this really convinced me for my own lab. I also said, like, using Murfish as, as one of the, the goals, let's put it like this. Great, thank you. Then maybe Johanna, you um, can stop sharing. And um, I would like to thank you and all the other instructors for the amazing two days and hand over to Fabian for last comments for this workshop. Yeah, thanks a lot, Anna, for, for the honor of 
speak in the closing words, you know, this is sort of how you can, can tell seniority, you basically don't understand all the details anymore. <laughs> Just like say bye and hi, but you know, happy to do that. Thanks so much. No, seriously, um, thanks uh, again for everyone for organizing this. And maybe if you don't mind, if you're around, we could, those at least who are still there, just like un, uh, unmute their, 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 their TV screens and say hi briefly and, and wait. Hey, yeah, Ima, thanks again for a nice presentation. Italy, that was awesome. Um, it would be great, by the way, to have you come over. I mean, I can write separately. Um, but thanks, thanks everyone for, 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 for taking the time. Um, this, this questionnaire, like I had this super ad hoc questionnaire yesterday, and that was already quite nice, but people kind of expect from this. I don't know if you saw this, Johanna, but there was sort of a bunch of terms what people want to learn from, from single cell, and your cell communication was a big thing. But there were a bunch, bunch, bunch of other sort of context-dependent topics that, that people would look for. Yeah, thanks, thanks for joining. We're going to do a bunch of fun additional meetings. You know, we're going to have a physical a single cell computation type of meeting coming up on, I think, 13th and 14th of, se of September here in Munich. So if you guys want to come over, we are all happy to host you. We have a bunch of really fantastic speakers joining it. Omar is coming, but also near Yosef, um, 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 Ashley Sanders, um, Lale Hakleri, a whole a bunch of really cool, cool, cool people. Also, um, more machine learning things. I think we call it single cell genomics meets data science or something like that. So I think sort of this computation aspect could be quite fun. We should be doing a bunch of additional workshops. And um, yeah, please, please, please stay connected. Uh, I guess this is such a new field. We just saw the discussion, this whole interface with the computer vision part that. And that, by the way, Anna, would be cool to have on the on the questionnaire as well. It's like everyone coming from single genomics. Are there some people sort of coming in from the computer vision side? I know by training, a lot of you have been, if you learn about machine learning, you learn about computer vision. But usually we work on this tabular data, right? Or maybe it's say graph-based data. But, you know, I think there's like really communities merging. I think there's a lot of stuff that, that could be done for fun. Looking forward to that. Um, yeah, I just take like one, one screenshot there. Well, maybe not because it's like a data security thing, but it's like wave. Thank you, everyone. Thanks particularly to Anna, Vitali, uh, Alma, Giovanni, David, uh, um, Johanna, Mara for organizing, uh, Skok, um, Marco for hosting. Yeah, like all of you. This was really cool. I, I, I thought it was very, very nice to see everyone. See you guys.